next talk would be the regulators are coming. Are Luna, UST, and Algo stablecoin doomed? Let's welcome Hayden Hughes, CEO at Alpha Impact on stage. There you go, sir. Great. Okay, hello. Nice to see everyone. Uh, so my name is Hayden Hughes. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Alpha Impact. And uh, Alpha Impact, as you can see, is a, so I'll just uh, go a little bit more. So I've been in crypto since 2017, and I am, for my sins, a recovering lawyer. And Alpha Impact is a non-custodial social trading platform. So we work with top traders and people who want to become or emulate those top traders. And we're also building an off-chain data analytics platform. So, uh, here's the agenda for today. WTF just happened. I won't spell out exactly what that acronym means. I trust everyone knows. We're going to be talking a little bit about Luna. We're going to talk about, are the regulators coming? And I think this is a really important point to be considering. Um, I'm not going to go crazy into the super boring legal stuff, because I know that tends to drive people to sleep. The next part is going to be looking at previous regulatory headwinds. So, we're going to be looking at uh, previous times where regulators have cracked down. What happened, what was the recovery, and what really happened after that. And we'll be, I'll be making some predictions about what's happening next. So, <clears throat> so, Luna, let's just talk a little bit about Luna. Luna was one of the top 10 crypto assets. I'm just going to stand a bit further back. Can everyone still hear me in the back? Okay. So Luna was one of the top 10 assets. And actually, in their white paper from early 2018, there's an interesting sentence here. It says, Terra operates under a decentralized guarantee of solvency, eliminating risks of currency failures and Soros attacks. So they're pretty woke to the idea that an algorithmic stablecoin could actually be attacked. Um, and somewhere along the way, things changed. So the original plan was to have Terra hold its value through contracting and um, changing the monetary supply of Luna, similar to uh, what central banks do with traditional currencies. They're the ones that cause all the inflation that we now have to deal with. And eventually the proposal changed and UST as we know it today was born. So UST was a little bit different from other stable coins. Other stable coins have a deposit of $1. UST was actually created by destroying $1 worth of Luna. And so what we saw is that $1 of Luna could always be redeemed for one dollar of UST and vice versa. And so this created a dependency. Sorry, hold on. Can I, excuse me, team, can I switch to the, the handheld mic, please? I don't know where it is. Um, so this created a dependency. For me to be able to uh, trust UST, I also had to trust Luna. And that meant that I had to believe that cashing out UST into Luna was going to be a good thing. Okay, let's just testing, testing. Okay, great. And so uh, a lot of folks developed the impression uh, very quickly recently, which is, I'm sure you're all aware, that Luna was actually not a safe investment. And so this came from a platform called Anchor. Um, for those that, uh, that don't know Anchor, they've pitched themselves here as the reliable savings protocol. Anchor was a, or still is, a DeFi uh, staking platform where you could deposit UST and earn a 20% rate of interest. And so... Um, this, for stable coins, this was actually one of the best deals on the market. I know there's some platforms, Cake DeFi and others, that had a higher rate. But for a non-fluctuating or theoretically non-volatile stable coin like UST, this was a pretty good deal. And in crypto, we tend to think of this as the risk-free rate. And so at one point, 72 percent of the supply of UST was actually staked on Luna or on Anchor. So this created a massive problem because there was a ton of UST being minted to incentivize people. Um, to put more on. Uh, some have called this Ponzi-nomics. I won't go that far. But uh, there's a dynamic at play where if you give me your money and trust me, I'll give you more. So that was what happened on Anchor. So let's talk a little bit about the death spiral. So in a, in a scenario where people don't believe that Luna is a good thing to be holding anymore, then all of a sudden that creates pressure not only on Luna, but also on UST. So people would need to um, if I don't believe that Luna is a good thing for me to hold or touch or want to be involved with in any way, I'll actually sell my UST. And this has a deleterious effect because selling UST and destroying it means that you're actually creating more Luna. And if you then go and sell the Luna, it has a kind of a double dipping effect where 
you're creating more Luna, which expands the supply and decreases the price, and you're selling that Luna. So it's, you're hitting the price twice. Um, so this creates selling pressure for both Luna and UST simultaneously. So what happened? So someone shorted Bitcoin, Luna, and UST all at the same time. And I won't get into the specific mechanics. It's fairly complex, the actual trades. But it's alleged that an, in, you know, an insider firm, uh, someone from Wall Street, Citadel, or BlackRock actually did this. And what ended up happening was that they simultaneously, on a day with very low liquidity, shorted all three of these assets at once. And that created the death spiral. So heavy losses were suffered. And if you can believe this, I mean, this is actually not as bad as it got for Luna. It, it actually got quite a lot closer to zero than this price. I just like this uh, photo. So you had an asset that used to be worth, you could see it was worth almost $100 at the end of April, crashing down to effectively zero. Um, that's the death spiral. So I want to share a little bit about how Alpha Impact, um, we haven't been directly involved in Luna, but um, we have traders on our platform that try to tell the rest of the world what is happening in crypto and try to uh, decode this complicated world. And so this is me. I actually posted on the platform saying, I think there's more downside here. So this is the day before the crash. Um, I was short Luna at that time. And for all the people that followed me for free, they would have had access to see this insight. This was one of our top returns on the day. So this is on May 10th. So someone actually made 208% on that day, shorting Luna. Uh, that's a short that I made, the exit there, 1,500%. And this is our top monthly return, and I took this just yesterday. So um, we have a lot of traders on our platform that have learned how to anticipate, deal with, and really engage with the market in a way that allows them to profit. So that's just a little uh, plug for what we do. So here's the question. Are the regulators coming? Um, if things happen, if banks are too big to fail, if there's losses to retail investors, the regulators will generally step in. And I think it's useful to understand what could actually happen and, and what would the implications be. So the official goals for regulators are to manage unemployment and inflation, obviously, but they also have goals to uh, protect unsophisticated investors. And so you see here the photo of the snake oil salesman. So this is 200 years ago. These snake oil salesmen used to roam around and sell these cure-all potions. You know, if you have diabetes, if you're bald, if you feel sick, no matter what the problem was, uh, you would actually, you could get better, they, would, they claimed, by buying their potion. And so in crypto, uh, there's a perception uh, in some circles, especially in regulatory circles, that uh, it's still the Wild West in crypto. And so U.S. regulators lead the world in uh, making noise about things in the crypto space, but also not passing any laws. And they've passed zero laws to do with crypto since the 2017 ICO run. So let's take a look at some of the previous regulatory headwinds, because I think it's useful if we're asking the question, what's going to happen next? It's important for us to understand what has happened previously and what might happen this time. So the SEC working to actually slow down and stop ICOs is one of the things that really started the last bear market in late 2017 and early 2018. So you've seen all kinds of headlines. The SEC stops coin offerings, fires warning shot files charges over ICO, and lawyer predicting an assembly line of enforcement. This didn't actually happen. They didn't actually go after 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 token issuers. But just the threat of the SEC saying, this is a serious issue. We think this is worth paying attention to, and we're going to try to slow this down or stop it. That was enough to actually really slow the industry down. And so the impact was that the bear market actually started then. We went down 83% that year in terms of asset prices. Third parties, including Facebook, Twitter, uh, all the social media platforms, basically made it impossible to advertise ICOs, which I think was a necessary step at that point in time because there were a lot of scams happening. And the ICO funding market died for two years, but we did end up seeing a gradual recovery and a stronger industry that emerged on the other side of that. And so you can actually see the global venture capital funding here. I mean, it's staggering that, you know, the delta between 2017 and 18 uh, was very staggering. But then if you actually zoom out and you look on the long term, the line is going up. Um, so with the amount of adoption and capital that's now in the space, I don't think whatever happens in the next 12 to 24 months means that it's game over. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, I think that there are some great companies that will be built uh, during this market cycle. So after 2017, no actual laws were passed. You had a number of other countries, including here in Singapore, pass laws to address uh, token issuance. But the law hasn't caught up, and so there's still a lot of carve-outs and loopholes. So um, next, I think it's good, 
it's worthwhile talking about the China ban. This is also something that happened in 2017. Now, um, for those OGs in the room, this is not actually China ban number one. This is like the third or fourth time China banned it. But um, we could just pretend for the purposes of this that, uh, that this is when it happened. And so you actually see here in early 2017, most of the trading volume in Bitcoin globally leading up to the start of 2017 was on these Chinese platforms. And if you talk to them, it was an absolutely crazy time. And China came out and said that they're investigating the FX and anti-money laundering practices of those ex excuse me, exchanges. And you see virtually within the span of one month, it was a collapse. So there was no actual impact on the price. And we actually saw the bull market continue. So China ban two happened in uh, 2021 when China said they were banning all of the mining activity that was happening in China. So what you see here is uh, hash rate, which is just a nice way of saying mining power. And you see China was previously the biggest and then they dropped off precipitously. So miners moved offshore in droves and the actual impact on the market uh, was positive. Um, so this assumes that you actually started buying Bitcoin at the time when a, the Chinese government banned it. And you can see here, it's actually a positive EV exercise, which means you would have made money every single time. So um, it presents a great mid-cycle buying opportunity. I like to think of the China ban being the flag that says the bull market is now 50% over because it tends to happen 50 to 60% through each bull market. And markets rebound. Um, so stablecoin regulations. So the Europeans are currently considering uh, legislating stablecoins. And it's not clear what it would look like because of Europe's uh, framework. Sorry. Because of Europe's uh, regulatory framework, the EU has a lot of work to do to actually pass laws. So this is currently a bill that's been approved that's being discussed. And the idea is that stable coins would be regulated by the, um, the pan-European securities regulator, ESMA. So um, this will be slow, and I think that the Europeans might actually lead the way here in a US election year. I don't think the US uh, will lead the way in terms of regulating. So the US, uh, so are the regulators coming? Um, Anecdotally, you know, we make pilots retire when they turn 65. I don't know why the US government, everyone is 75 to 90. Um, if anyone has an answer to that, please approach me after. But uh, this is uh, Janet Yellen saying that stricter regulations are needed. Um, and Terra is, I think, just the start of what we'll see from the US. So this is a quote from Janet. Financial risk mounts as the outstanding market cap of stable coins is growing rapidly. And I actually think that stablecoin regulations in the US and other countries are inevitable because they're growing so rapidly that they're becoming a major force in the global financial sphere. So it's not going to happen this year. Uh, we've already got a lot happening in the United States with inflation and don't even get me started. I could talk for hours and hours on end. But uh, lots of stuff happening that I think makes it very difficult politically uh, for any changes in the United States. So um, I want to share with the audience some predictions for, uh, for what I think is likely to happen next. So my first prediction is that, uh, and by the way, there will be a few minutes at the end for, uh, for questions. My first prediction is that Luna will never be the same. Um, and I think CZ said it best. He said he's disappointed with how the incident was handled by the Terra team. Binance requested the teams to restore the network, burn the extra minted Luna, and recover the UST peg. Remember, this whole thing started with UST, something that was supposed to be worth a dollar, death spiraling and no longer being worth a dollar. That caused a crisis of confidence um, that, in CZ's words, could have been recovered, uh, but they haven't done anything. And he notes that this is actually in sharp contrast to another product, project that had problems, Axie Infinity, who were very responsive, proactive, and had a plan. So this is Ethereum Classic. And Ethereum Classic is an interesting story because it was created in 2015. Uh, there was a project that raised money in 2015 using the the original Ethereum, and it turned out there was a bug in the Ethereum blockchain. So they made a new version of Ethereum, and this was the hardcore old school one, Ethereum Classic, not used by anyone, and it's actually been attacked, and there have been multiple, I wouldn't call it hacks, but what we call 51% attacks, where the blockchain is taken over by bad people. Um, and this has happened multiple times, and you can see the price here since you know, the start of 2017 has actually risen astronomically. So it's clear to me that um, there is precedent in the markets for a kind of a dead coin that doesn't have a lot of con confidence from the market to grow very aggressively. Um, the second prediction I want to make, and I just want to be very clear about this, is that I think there's a massive risk in lending platforms. So today, uh, there are a number of centralized lending protocols, and the, the basic pitch is this. Um, 
You give them your assets, they deploy your assets and make some money, and they pay you a fixed rate of interest, obviously much lower than they're actually generating. So these platforms, there's dozens of them, and I think there could be a massive problem brewing that could cause uh, very serious events in the crypto industry. Um, so centralized protocols like Nexo, BlockFi, et cetera, had exposure to UST. Now, uh, BlockFi, I don't think had any, di had any direct exposure, but BlockFi, these platforms also lend. They don't just borrow, they lend. And so they would now have people that would have lost all, well, a substantial amount of assets that they wouldn't be able to repay. Um, and, you know, by the way, there are actually, I'm not going to name which one, but there's a lending protocol that's kind of on this list I'm about to show you that was going to send a speaker and ended up pulling the speaker. So I don't know if that's coincidental or not. I'm not going to say which one. Um, so some of these lending protocols might have had third-party risk, and some of them might have actually gone and taken your money and just bought UST and put it in an anchor, which would mean that they could actually be not having enough liquidity today. And so this phenomenon might actually explain why the rates haven't changed. And so you could see here, there's only these four platforms that have reduced their interest rates. And I could just tell you, I'm a market professional, the ability to generate yield on deposited assets has changed. So I can now generate less yield than I could on May 1st or May 2nd. And you would expect that institutions that pay interest would reflect this in the interest that they pay. But only four of them have. And um, I know a lot of the people from a lot of the teams, BlockFi, Abra, HODLNOT, my friends at HODLNOT, I think they're here, very great company. Um, they've reduced their rates. That tells me that they're actually not afraid of having withdrawals from the platform. But the others have not changed anything. And that tells me that they're actually afraid of people withdrawing. Now, I don't know if they don't have enough to repay those loans, but it's certainly a feasible possibility. And you can see the yields are different as well. Um, and so the thesis, if some of these platforms are underwater, and just to be very clear, I'm not saying that I think any of these platforms are underwater. I'm just saying there is a risk that they could be. Um, if they are underwater and don't have enough to repay people, then they would, of course, be much happier to take a slow loss over time rather than have a bank run and potentially cost the entire business. So if one of these large lending platforms collapses, I think that would cause a crisis of confidence of 2008 proportions. That could affect USDT. Um, I won't talk a lot about USDT, but there um, have been people over the years who have been saying that <clears throat> maybe it's not truly backed one-to-one -one with dollars. Um, I don't know what the case is, but this could be a massive crisis. <clears throat> so prediction number three, the VC landscape is changing. So RIP good times, uh, those of us who have been around for a while probably recognize this. So the funding market has drastically changed. And actually, Alpha Impact just got our lead investor for our safe round, so we're OK. But we're hearing a lot from VCs that things have really changed. And everyone assumed that all these VCs had invested in Luna and that Luna was a safe thing to do. All the biggest names in crypto had invested in Luna, Terra Labs, uh, and everyone had this assumption that, well, those guys did the checking, right? <clears throat> this is a quote from a VC earlier this week. We have time to do the due diligence we didn't do in 2021. So this is just a shift of how the VC landscape is changing. And I talked a little bit about dry powder, the amount of capital that VCs have. So we're now at a record high. Uh, predic prediction four, Luna will be like an Ethereum classic. Talked a little bit about this. Prediction five, the US, the US will regulate stable coins. It's just a question of when. Uh, as I mentioned, the lending protocol could go down. That could cause a systemic risk to the industry. Other governments will regulate stable coins, and DeFi could temporarily shrink. Um, prediction six, the Bitcoin halving in early 2024 will see another bull market. So one thing that I've learned is that what goes down must go up. Um, so the supply of Bitcoin contracts every four years. That causes a bull market within 18 months after that. So we're pretty comfortable with that uh, reality in 2024. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, Really uh, grateful to have you all here. This is us. We're doing a platform demo. We've booked a meeting room over near the cafe at Sweet Spot. So if you want to come and check out Alpha Impact and get a demo of we're doing what we're doing, you're welcome to scan the QR code. My details are here. So uh, thank you very much. And really looking forward to hearing your questions. <laughs>